Okay. Begin. So, uh, last time we spoke about related rates. those examples we did um, gives you a good idea of how to get through that. Today we are going to talk about a completely different topic called linear approximation. And differentials, which they're talking about the same thing, it's just a, a different point of view I guess. We'll talk about that. thinking, it seems long overdue, Trevon, and I would agree with you, um, because we kind of mentioned the whole point of being able to draw tangent lines was to find linear approximation, and it seems like um, it's been a while, and we haven't spoken about this yet, but there are many important things about derivatives, and now we're going to talk about one of the most important ones, um, approximation, how they help us to approximate functions that might otherwise be um, difficult to deal with. And the examples we're going to use in this class it aren't functions that are difficult to deal with, but it's just to show you, like, in theory, how you would actually approach the situation. If you actually had a function that was difficult for you to deal with and difficult for you to use to compute things, how would you use approximations to help you um, evaluate the function at difficult points? Okay. Um, but we're going to use very simple functions. We're going to talk about things like square roots and cube roots and, hey, let's approximate stuff with these guys. Um, it's not that this is actually used for that, but it's just to illustrate one of the ways in which we can do it. Um, so the idea here is um, is that the tangent line can be used to approximate a function. Assuming the function is differentiable and all that, um, close to the point of tangency. So the idea is maybe you have a function doing its thing. Let's say it's doing this, whatever. Y, x, and let's say you had you are drawing a tangent line here. the tangent line to the function. And let's say at this point, you kind of, at this current point, x comma y, you kind of know what's going on. In, in fact, you know the value of x, call it a, and the value of y, call it f of a. And you actually are able to, at that specific point, um, you know about the function, you know about its rate of change at that point, and you can therefore um, construct the tangent line. What we care about is maybe some other point. Eventually, you would have moved on from this point, and there's some other point of the function that you are now interested in figuring out what's going on there. Right? So this point here, say that was x, x1 and x2. So you can actually move some distance over here, which we would call the change in x. So we know what's going on at this point, but now we're interested at some other point, some distance away. Okay? So you can actually think of this coordinate as some new coordinate that you now care about. Right? So let's see that as data today. This is now x, y. So now you're kind of concerned about figuring out what that y value is, but maybe the function itself is kind of complicated. The idea is the difference between the function and the tangent line, the closer you get to the point of tangency, um, becomes smaller and smaller. So there are times where finding this point is going to be really hard or difficult or just annoying. However, finding this point that lies right above it will be a lot easier because that's just the point lying on a straight line. And finding the equation of the straight line, computing that point is going to be easy. So a lot of times finding this point is a lot easier than finding that point. And the idea is, the closer you are to the point of tangency, the closer these values will give you. They will give you a very similar output. So it turns out that within a proximity, um, the tangent line 
can actually give you a very good approximation for the curve. Okay. And I'm going to tell you about some notation that we might use to talk about these distances because it's going to be especially important when we talk about differentials. But so let's say here, here's the original y value. This is the guy we know. So this is the original y value. And we can talk about here the y value of the actual function of the new point. Or we call it the new y value. There's a name that we give to this distance here. We call that delta y. So the difference between the original y value and the new y value, the actual absolute value distance, uh, we call that delta y. And that's a delta. It's a, the uppercase Greek letter delta. Now, the difference between the tangent line, the y value of the tangent line, and the original, that we call dy, um, as in the numerator of the uh, Leibniz notation of the derivative. Okay. And in fact, your x being the input, you kind of have pretty much total control over this. Um, so you actually will know how much your x is changing. And so your dx and your delta x is often the same. Right? That's not really something in an approximation. The idea is the dy is used to approximate the delta y. And the idea is further being the closer we are to this point, the closer these would look, be the same. And so here they might look very different, but the idea is if you zoom in closer, the length, the distance between these two will actually be um, pretty similar. And so the idea is uh, for linear approximation, you will use the dy to approximate the delta. Because those two will be very close together, the closer you are. And so you might not know what the delta y is at some point, but you can find the dy via calculus. And so you can often use the dy to approximate the delta y. That's kind of the, the big picture. Um, and how we actually do this, the, how, what, if we were looking at the process for actually doing this, the process would simply be to find the equation of the tangent line and use the equation of the tangent line in place of the equ equation of the actual function. That's basically what it comes down to. We're going to say y for the actual f of x function is going to be super close to the tangent line function. Now, if you think, how do you actually find the equation of a tangent line? Well, do, do, well, do you want to use the tangent line as a straight line? So it would be, um, I'm going to use the function where you use y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. And I can bring the y1 to the other side. That's the point that you already know the coordinate for, plus m x minus x1. So using that idea, the fact that I can actually write the equation of the line in this form, I'm going to do that. So the y1 is the value that we currently know, which according to this diagram, I call the f of a. Plus the m, well, we know what gives us the m. The derivative gives us the m. And then the x minus x1, that would be x minus a. So just by using the equation of the tangent line, I can pretend that that's the definition of the function if my a and my x are very close together. Um, and that's going to be this derivation. IB, if you want to approximate f of x, which you don't really know what it is, you can approximate that value by plugging in this value. And 
the approximation gets better once your A coordinate is very close to your X coordinate. If the distance between these two is very small, the better and better it is. And this is called the linear approximation formula. It's pretty much the formula for the tangent units. But it's relating the formula for the tangent line to the formula of the original function. And it's saying, you know what, these are almost the same. And the approximation, so that's the linear approximation formula. The approximation is better the closer x is to a. Okay, so now let's actually put this together in a method and tell you when you might want to use the linear approximation formula. But maybe I should tell you something else about that. Uh, the function, which we often call big L of x, equals this. Is called. So we know our y value is going to be approximately this value. If we look at this value and we define it to be a function in its own right, sometimes we call that big L, we call this the linearization. another form way of saying that that's going to be the y equals this is going to be the equation of the tangent line near x equals a. But you'll you'll see this line with you. Sometimes the, the you'll be asked to say find the linearization of this function. It means you're looking for this. Or use the linearization to do blah. It means you're going to use this. So now let's put it into practice. So the idea now being is that sometimes you want to know about the value of a function or what a function is doing, but the function itself is very difficult to deal with. But what you do know is that at a point close to that point that you care about, you kind of know a lot more about what's going on. So given these two conditions, okay, we want to get a handle on a certain function. Um, that using that function directly is very difficult to deal with. However, if the point we care about is super close to another point that we kind of know this information for, we can use that information to talk about the original function. So now um, the idea is you will care about f of x, but you will choose a point A close to x to approximate the value. <coughs> this point, is, it's getting a lot a bit long-winded and repetitive. So let's actually see um, some examples here. So you can see what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, example. And this is, again, a very typical way to phrase a problem like this. Um, use linear approximation 
or differentials. We'll talk about differentials in a bit. To approximate the square root of 3.99 So approximately 3.9. Now, I know the square root function isn't crazily complicated. You can just whip out your calculator and plug in the square root of 3.99. Let's say we want to do this without a calculator. Right? Just to show you how this would actually work. Right? You can pretend that the square root function is super complicated. Okay. So here's how you would go. We would basically start to find the linearization of the function um, that will allow us to find this guy. So if I want to approximate the square root of 3.99, um, maybe you can think of a function that might be useful to look at. Square root of 4. Well, that's a value. What is the function? If I were to say f of x equals blah, I'm going to pick a function that's going to help me get a handle on this. What would you say? The square root of x, right? So I want to find the square root of 3.99. Look at the square root of x function. What I really want is to evaluate that function at the value 3.99. Right? So, so here is our first step. We're going to set f of x to be the square root of x. And you can notice we want f of 3.99. So that is like an f of x value that we want to find. Now most of you won't know what is the square root of 3.99 off the top of your heads, but yes, you do know the square root of 4, as she said. 4 is super close to 3.99. Okay. So given that the x value here is 3.99, I'm going to pick a value close to that, that I kind of know what's going on. The square root of 4 is super easy to calculate, and it's relatively close to 3.99. I wouldn't pick the number 1, even though I know what the square root of 1 is, because that's relatively far from 3.99. I wouldn't pick the number 16, again, relatively far from 3.99. 4 is the number that's super close to 3.99, closer than all other numbers that I know what's going on, and it, uh, I know all these values for. Okay. So, so here you can see, here, x equals 3.99, and we want we would choose a to be actually the number 4. Okay? So you have to approximate some weird thing. You're going to develop a function that you know can get you to the answer you want, and you're going to realize that, well, uh, plugging in a specific point is what's going to make this work. And, but the specific point they ask you about is kind of weird, like who knows what the square root of 3.99 is. Um, but there's a very nice value closely that we do know. So what you're going to do two is you're going to find f prime. Why? Because it's in the form of that I erased. Well, it's over here. Okay. So f prime in this case would be what? find these values, our f of a and our f prime of a. So here, we're going to find f of 4, and we're going to find f prime of 4. Now, f of 4 is just the square root of 4, which we know is 2. That's why we picked 4. It's just something we know the answer very quickly. f prime of 4 is going to be 1 over 2 radical 4. It's going to be a quarter. Again, that's pretty easy. But that was the point. Now, fourth, you're going to apply the linear approximation formula. So what we're going to see is that the square root of 3.99, that's what I actually care about. Well, that's just f of 3.99. But according to the linear approximation formula, that is going to be super close to 
function f of 4 plus f prime of 4 um, times 3.99 minus 4. Okay? So this is just me plugging the values into the formula. Here's my x, here's my a, a, x minus a. Simply plugging these into the linear <coughs> approximation formula. This is, of course, equal to 2 plus a quarter times, what is this going to be? Minus 0 0.01. I can look at that as minus 1 over 100. So this is 2 minus 1 over 400. And this is, well, this I can think of 800 over 400. So this becomes 799 over 400. And that is my approximation. This is going to be uh, 799 over 400. Now, uh, what is that actually? Can anyone like, uh, not in a quiz or an exam, so you can pull out a calculator. Can someone tell me what that is? Actually, type that in. 799 divided by 400, tell me what you get. 1.9975. 1.9975. Okay. Now, if you take, plug into your calculator the square root of 3.99. Right, so, so this is the approximation. This is the actual answer. Well, complete to however many decimal places your calculator goes up to. What is the calculator telling you? Yeah. Uh, 400, sorry. This, I want to compute this. Yeah, what, what would this be? If you actually use the square root function in your calculator. 1.99749. 1 1.99749. What? 4.36. Right. So you can kind of see, <coughs> if we were to round this to four decimal places, this is correct to four decimal places. Super close to the actual answer. Pretty accurate up to the ten thousandth place, and no calculator. I did that by hand. And that's just me, just one man, just Javon. Imagine if you gave a supercomputer the ability to do this thing. What could a com that do with it? You know what I mean? I'm over here just doing it by hand, found the answer to four decimal places. Imagine if you had something with actual computing power, knowing that, hey, if something's complicated, just do this. Let's look at another example. Okay, so here we're, we're good up to four decimal places with no calculator. So now, you're in an exam and they're, they're like, write your answer correct to three decimal places and you don't have a calculator. <laughs> okay, anyway. okay. Uh, another example. What about to approximate this one, the cube root function, say the cube root of 8.01. Okay. And the first part would be, use linear approximation to approximate root or estimate the cube root. That's going to be it. Okay. So what we would do here is, again, you set up a function that's going to really mimic the number that you want to get. So here, it seems like the cube root function is the obvious choice. You can note here that your x value, the value you actually care about, is 8.01. You would pick the a value of, what would you pick for a? 8. It's relatively close to 8.01, and it's certainly the closest number to 8.01 that I know the cube root of. Okay. So here you find f prime. What's 
f prime. One third x to the negative two thirds. Right. One third x to the negative two thirds, so that's the q root of x squared. So now I'm actually going to find these two values. What is f of 8 and what is f prime at 8? So f of 8, plug in an 8 here, that will give you 2. Uh, if I look at f prime of 8, I would plug in uh, 8 here. I'd probably take the cube root first, right, to make it easier. So I get 2 squared, that's 4, times 3, that's 12. Number 12. And so now I can plug into the linear approximation formula. So this means the cube root of 8.01 is actually f of 8.01, but I know that is approximately equal to f of 8 plus f prime of 8 times x. Minus eight. That is equal to 2 plus 1 over 12, and this would be 0, 1, which is positive 1 over 1,000. So this is 2 plus 1 over 1,200. Uh, so this would be 2,400 over 1,200 plus 1. So that's 2,401 over 1,200. That would be my approximation. That would be your answer. Um, but just for fun, let's do the same thing. So if you look at uh, 2401 over 1200 and actually compare that in your calculator to the cube root of 8001, what numbers are we getting here? The top one's 2.000833. Zero, 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 a bunch of threes. And three forever? Yeah. Okay. This one? It's 2.000832986. So if I round it, oh, we're going to up to six decimal places. We're even better here. Which, uh, some the behavior of the function sometimes tell you how much uh, how much more accurate you can be. Um, some of like a cube root will be more accurate with a square root because it grows at a different rate. Um, if you're using a function like e to the x, it's probably not going to be as accurate because e to the x grows really fast, so a little bit of x change can result in a huge y change, and so that's going to be different. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're approximating a cube root, you'll tend to be better than approximating a square root. But six decimal places without a calculator, that's pretty good. So, now you know, if you're ever on a deserted island without a calculator, and it's a matter of life and death, that you find the cube root of 8.01 correct to six decimal places, now you know how you do it. That's, that's how you use math in real life. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's actually find a linearization. Now, sine is one of those weird functions where everyone's familiar with it, everyone kind of knows how it behaves, but no one really has like an intuitive note. You know, when you say the sine of something, what does that really mean? What is the calculations you go through to figure something like that out? So it's a relatively simple function, but computationally, it's, unless you're at a very special angle, it's kind of hard to know uh, what it is. But let's suppose you are at an angle that's super close to pi over 6. And for some reason, you want to figure out what is the sine function going to give you at pi over 6, uh, or at some value close to pi over 6, what would that output be? Um, you might compute the linearization to this function at that point. So remember, the 
linearization is this function L of x, which is going to be f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And the x is going to stay there. It's going to remain a function of x. You're pretty much finding the equation of the tangent line. That's your linearization. So clearly, uh, we need to know the derivative. So we go f prime plus the sine. Hopefully by now we know that its derivative is cosine. We also would know, hopefully, what is f of pi over 6 and what is f prime of pi over 6. What is sine of pi over 6? Cosine of pi over 6. Radical 3 over 2. And so you can write down the linearization. have an x value that's super close to pi over 6 and you want to know what would the sine function give me? You can actually plug that x value in here, calculate this number, and it'll be actually very close to what the sine function would actually give you. So when we're close to pi over 6, uh, and the point of this function Yes, I know it's a silly example, but this is calculus one. It's not meant to be super complicated. It's meant to be, okay, I kind of would know how to do it anyway, but it's nice to see that us going through this process actually does get us close to the actual answer. So the sine function isn't super complicated, but it's nice to know. I can actually use a straight line to approximate a sine function. Now, in actuality, the actual function here is going to be super comp. You would only do this if the actual function is really super complicated. Right? You have functions that are very, very complicated. Where to figure out the simplest things, you, you would actually need to run a supercomputer to, to process all the data um, that would go into that function. And sometimes you don't have time for that. So you can just um, have the function instead look for approximations at key points that are like straight lines. And then whenever you need to get an answer, it approximates it by y equals mx plus b, as opposed to actually going through that whole function. So x is going to be the ugly value that you don't really know what the answer is. And you choose a, which is a nice value, close to x. And you can use that to actually find the answer. Now, the idea behind differentials is uh, super similar. It's pretty much the same thing, except you use a different notation. So usually if you have a problem uh, that says, use linear approximation or use differentials, using either or, I wouldn't care. You get full credit. Uh, they're, they're really the same thing. It's just you're writing it down in a different way. Um, same idea, different notation. So it's like the differentials would be when you're using the Leibniz notation and the linear approximation forms when you're using Newton's prime notation, but they're the same idea.
the idea, of course, being um, if you have y equals f of x, then using the Leibniz notation, the derivative of y with respect to x would be f prime of x. And so you can find approximate the change in y by this guy dx. Now, remember, your dx is actually, it's meant to be the approximation of the change in x, but it's usually equal to um, the actual change in x, because that's the input value. You will know exactly how much you want to actually change it by. So usually your approximation here is going to be the actual change. And so you can actually say this is actually equal to x minus a, for example. And so, the idea here is that um, given f of x with we can approximate f when a small change is made to x. So the idea is, um, we know about a function at a certain value, let's say a, but now I want to move a little bit. Let's say I move a little bit by delta x. Right, so now, I know what's going on at f of a, but someone asked me, what is f of a plus a little bit? Well, the idea here is going to be, well, it's going to be the original function plus a, cha a little change in y. Right? Well, technically it's actually this, but then you approximate that by this, as we were explaining earlier, and then we can realize that this, via this derivation, is really just going to be f prime of a times your delta x. And we know that your delta x is actually this. So you realize that these two formulas are exactly the same. And the name comes from, in this section, from this guy. This is called the differential of y. So you usually don't write down this notation. You kind of write it down this way. And then for this value, you plug in what you calculated over here. Um, but as you can see, if you just if you kind of translate everything and plug in everything else, you'll get exactly the linearization formula that we got last time. It's just that here you don't necessarily think of it that way. You kind of think of just taking your function, differentiating it, finding the change of y via this, and then just adding it to the old value, which is exactly the same what this is. Right? This was the value, and now you're adding a change to that value to figure out the new value. Same idea, different notation. These guys are usually used in uh, word problems. Huh? But you could just as well use these guys. So here's an example. Let me kind of summarize the main idea before doing the example. Is that you're thinking of your f of a plus dx as being close to f of a plus dy. That's kind of the, how you think about it in your head. So you can think of whichever way is more comfortable for you. I tend to like linearization better, but whatever. At this point, they're the same. Here's an example. The radius of a right circular cylinder is 20 centimeters.
its height is 10 centimeters. There is a possible error point zero one centimeters in each of these dimensions. So let's say you have a cylinder, use some sort of machine to measure its dimensions, and the result comes back, okay, the radius is 20 and the height is 10. However, through limitations of the machine's construction, you know that whatever answer this machine gets you, it could be wrong by that much. Okay? So when it tells you 20 centimeters, it could actually be as big as 20.01 centimeters, right? That there's an extra 0.1 that you might assume. The, the machine measures an error, give or take um, 0.01 centimeters. So here, A, find the max error in computing the volume. So you have the dimensions of the cylinder, you want to actually find its volume. You want to find, if we know that measuring this has an error inherent in it, how would measure, what's the error inherent in the volume? If we actually were to calculate that. And what is the relative error? That, that, when you say relative error, it basically means you want to talk about the error as a percentage of what the actual value is. Oh, we're off by 2% or whatever. So usually when a problem like that shows up, where they say, okay, here are some measurements we made, but we could be wrong by this much. How does that affect this other result that we calculated? based on those possibly erroneous measurements, right? What's the worst case scenario here, right? A lot of times you want to know that. So a lot of times, like I said, life isn't always hunky-dory and there isn't always an exact answer. Sometimes we make measurements in the world and they're just not the best measurements. We know we could be wrong by this much, but we do want to know what are the consequences of these? Do we actually need to come up with a whole new process or is the possible errors here small enough that we can just let it slide? Right? Questions like this are important, right? So, if you're measuring, um, for example, uh, the amount of concrete you need to go into building a huge bridge that stretches two miles long, right? You're going to be off by a few pounds, maybe a few hundred pounds. Is the bridge now unsafe? Right? Things like that are, are questions you might want to answer. And apparently we're out of time, so we'll answer that next time. But that, that's the last question in this section. And uh, yeah, we'll move on to masses and means next. But linear approximation, very important. And this is just rounding out that idea. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.